Hey guys, Chris Gurry here at the Drummer's Guide to Gear. I would like to give a big thanks to Mr. Thomas Pridgen sitting down with us while he's on tour. And Jerry here for letting us use his shop. This is in Colorado Springs, the Drum Shack on Fillmore. Oh, Jerry, if you want to give a little info about the shop real quick, we'll get this going. Uh, we're just a full service pro drum shop. Students uh, flowing through here all the time with our, all of our private lessons. Full repair. Sales, new and used, so any, and hammerhead custom drums. Any Southern Colorado drummers support your local music stores, you know? I know we're all Please. guilty of uh, shopping big box stores, but local music shops, you know, they give you the service and treatment that you deserve. But I'd like to thank Jerry again for letting us use the shop. Let me jump out of you guys' way. Appreciate it. So uh, I ain't gonna go over a lot of the stuff. I think everyone knows you're the youngest Guitar Center drum off winner. Right. Youngest Zildjian endorser ever. I was the youngest drummer ever to win a drum off. Well, the, the Guitar <laughs> Center, but. That's cool. Uh, I just wanna talk to you a little bit about uh, the gig you got with uh, Suicidal. How'd that come about? Um, well, the gig, well, Suicidal came about because I knew, I knew a few of the guys, and Eric Moore is one of my good friends, so I was always kicking with him at the shows when they came to town. And um, a good friend by the name of Thundercat, um, that I, he's now a solo artist. Um, he's, a, he's a dear friend, and I played on his record, and I toured him a lot, off and on. Um, he was also playing with Suicidal for a long time. And um, they won, I guess what, what originally happened was they needed me to be in a video you know, because um, Eric couldn't be there. And so they wanted to get, you know, somebody who, I guess people knew they were shuffling names and my name yeah. came across and I was down to do it because um, mainly because I like to have fun. Gotcha. And then um, the gig came about, um, I don't really know, you know, I just, they asked me to do it and um, I was down. And um, it was fun, like now, like for me, I like enjoy I enjoy playing like a lot of different styles of yeah. music and not only playing them but like getting able to play them at a high level or you know showcase my talents on a record or yeah. a tour so before this I was doing trash talk and I was doing um, others like Snoop Dogg and I did you know a lot of stuff in my band the memorials and um, yeah so for me it was always also did Lauren Hill which was like we did a record I did a record with Lauren Hill and it was like an African-esque kind of record. And so I just really enjoyed being able to just jump across the board on the genres. So when they called, I was just interested because it was like another opportunity to just be like playing some new stuff. Something different. Yeah. Gotcha. And I enjoy those dudes and I appreciate, you know, the legacy that they have as, yeah, you know, musicians as a band. So I was like, man, it's like it was a no-brainer when I do it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I noticed on social media I follow you on all your stuff, but... Uh, Everyone's talking about this new DW setup with yeah, double yeah. kicks. Everyone's like, oh my God, he's, <laughs> he's playing double kicks. You know? what, what made you just decide to do that? Just something, well, just a um, bigger kit for No, nah, well, a lot of people didn't really know that I was already practicing double bass. Like, I have, uh, I had another kit that, it was a yellow Tony Williams kit. Um, Tony Williams' um, estranged wife, is it strange wife? Wife, widow, whatever, yeah, wife, widow. Um, would not um, allow DW to actually put those red hoops and lugs on a yellow kit, so um, DW sent me a yellow kit, and I have it. And it's just like, you know, 10, 12, 13, 14, 15, no, maybe 15, 16, 18, it was three, four times, two bass drums, and a snare. And I was already practicing on that, and before I used to play with Wicked Wisdom, which is Jada Pickett's band, and I was playing double bass. Um, so people didn't really know, yeah. but um, I just decided to do double bass on this one because I knew we were doing shows with Slayer, yeah. and I knew it would look cooler. Yeah. And, um, you know, and if you listen to some of those suicidal records, especially the ones that have, um, um, they have Brooks Wackerman on them, like Freedom, those records, he's playing double bass. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, he'll play, like, da 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 do like, you know, yeah. and I just like that. I think, you know, Brooks is awesome, and I want to make the music sound like the people who listen to the records remember them, because yeah. they have nostalgic feelings, you know? And I want them to feel like they were in high school, and like when they were rowdy, and like, and that's the kind of people we have coming. People who were like, man, I ain't seen suicidal in 25 years, man. Yeah. But you make me go back to when I, you know. And that's what I like, cause I understand that from being in my band and having other people come and sub in. I know where, how it feels to hear something and it's played how you meant it to be played. So I appreciate it. So I kind of that was another reason I did the double bass thing. That's cool. That's uh. Yeah, like you say, I guess that makes the most sense. You want yeah. to play it how it was meant to be played. Yeah. 
Um, what's your favorite and least favorite thing about touring? Um, I think my favorite thing about touring is um, getting to meet all these people. Getting to meet, like, getting to hang out with Paul Bostoff and meeting, like, hanging out with Mike, you know, just, like, kind of asking them questions about how they feel, you know. Getting to hang out with, um, you know, Kerry King or, yeah. you know, or Nico from, or Dean or Tim or or just like even people like that don't even play. You know, you meet all these different people all across. Some guy be like, man, I got a pizza shop, or you know, I tattoo, or you know, all these people who are are all connected in the same way of music, but all do something different. And I feel like um, as like a community, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm traveling, so I'm all I'm almost in a level creating a community that's based around myself. So when I go around, I'm like, oh, I remember that dude who has a pizza shop. Let's go over there. Now, if I'm not with Suicide or I'm with Snoop, I could be taking Snoop to this pizza spot. So now my friends that I'm, that I'm having from all these different places are meeting each other. And um, so it happens a lot like that because I'll go to Amsterdam or wherever I go and I'll be like, yo, make sure you go there. Yeah. Because we also have other musicians that are our friends who are traveling. So I think that's a, the, the biggest part that I love. And getting to play every night in front of people and getting to... Um, you know, like even though we're all like bands and we all love music, like we all have friendly competition. Like I like to look at Paul Bostoff when he's playing with Slayer and be like, look at this. And he, he's doing that too in my in my film. I'm in the crowd, you know, bringing yeah. him on. So I, I love that part too. And um, and the least favorite, I think the least favorite thing that I have a problem with is just like, um, you know, the constant being in cities you just don't want to be in. Like, you know, like, I don't want to be in South Dakota. Like, I'm sure, like, at least if I'm not playing. Like, yeah. if I'm not playing, a lot of times I don't want to be in certain cities. Yeah. Especially being how I am and, like, so open-minded and, like, sometimes it just doesn't work. Like, I got pulled over by the cops in South Dakota for, I was in a sushi place. And they pulled me over saying I look like a shooting suspect. I'm like, and they said, you imported me out of the whole crew is like obviously because we're in South Dakota where they would be the most weirdest people ever so I'm um, not saying people from South Dakota yeah. are weird yeah. but I'm just saying so it was you know stuff like that happens but it doesn't happen all the time but like that's the thing that makes it kind of weird when you're in a place you just don't want to be at you know like I love coming to Colorado and and um, and I could come to Colorado and not play and have fun. Like yeah. I love going to the cities where it's like it's fun regardless, because that adds to the shows. And and also when people don't have a lot of stuff to do in a city, it adds to the fun because we're the fun. And they're like, man, you guys are the fun. So you know, and that's why I got some places you would never think are the the most awesome places in the world, like Fort Wayne, Indiana. Like that place is like I feel like that could be my second home, or like I've been to you know, Wyoming and had just blasts, like, not even, you know, Fort Wayne when I was playing, but, you know, sometimes I just, I, I, I even, I shock myself with having experiences in cities where I would never think, so yeah. that could be good and bad. That's pretty much the, the real big one, and then, like, be not being a, around people that you love the yeah. most, that could be weird, especially if you're in a weird headspace, you know, because people have a weird headspace at their homes. Yeah. You know what I mean? And they have a weird headspace on tour. So for me, I just try to stay focused and keep contact with my friends and, you know, don't lose sight of what I like to do. You know, I go out and go get tattooed or go play or go bowling or go to the yeah. arcade or go to a bar. I do regular stuff. Um, I don't know. That's pretty it, much it. It probably all comes back to, too, like you are saying, touring as much as you do and have met, meeting people in different cities. It's kind of like an extended family. So yeah. if you are somewhere familiar and you're just kind of in a like, funk or whatever. Gotta go to the drum like, shop. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Let's go hang out, you know? That's cool. It makes the most sense. And uh, back home, you know, like uh, thanking Jerry for that, yeah. what are some of your favorite, you know, smaller drum shops you've hit, you know? Man, at home? Dude, like these guys are going to love me because I know all you guys' names. <laughs> um, I Man, back home we got, you know, well now some of them closed. Like we had Sam Adato's, we had Drum World, which was in San Francisco. Um, we still have Starving Musician, which has a few shops, and Starving Musician has like keyboards and guitars and yeah. all that stuff. Then we have um, still got Gelb and Lemon Percussion, and um, it's another spot that I'm I'm forgetting that I'm feeling really Banana, Banana, which is in San Rafael. Um, I haven't been there in a long time, but I remember my grandma used to just like every Saturday that was our field trips. Yeah, like we'd go hit the drum shops. 
and you know random days. Let's go to let's go to this one and it'd be forty five minutes. Let's go to this one and be forty five minutes the opposite direction. So they all knew me from always coming. And then it was um, another guy. Um, he used to make drums. His name was Diamico. And some people still have his drums, but he had a shop that we would go to, and he would have like everybody's drums in there. And and you know we still like have relationships with the people at Guitar Center because a lot of them are friends. Yeah. And so um, like you know in a bind I'll go to Guitar Center, but I I rarely ever buy I rarely ever buy drum stuff outside of a boutique shop. Yeah. Like it's usually like you know even places that's not in the in um, in the California I'll go to like um, I'll go to Forks. Yeah. Or Memphis Drum Shop, or um, our Rubs, or you know um, Dunnett, and all those dudes in Seattle, and um, I just I go around, you know, I just it's just so many of them that are just like yeah. they're so yeah. close to me. Where it's like if I'm in Chicago, I'm like, oh, we should need to go to the Vintage Spot, or yeah. or Vix, you know. So I, it's just it's I don't know, it's kind of weird because I'm like so like weird with the drums since I see so much. Yeah, I only buy stuff I really want, like yeah. you know. Some stuff is like the DW stuff, you know, I get that and a lot of it matches the drum set. And then I have like a lot of snares that aren't DW that are just everybody else, but I don't really get to play them. You know what I mean? They're kind of like a stash thing. Yeah, yeah. And, um, but I've been meaning to like really get into like the vintage game. I just don't be on Craigslist enough. You know what yeah, I mean? That's what I was going to ask <laughs> next, uh, you know, being out on the road, if you ever get to find some hidden treasure, you know, yeah. pawn shop or, you know, mom and pop music shop, you know. I do. My, I, I, I really do. My grandmother died like two years ago, and she used to be that person who would be in like a random city. Like, I'm in Vegas at this spot. They got this pearl that you won't ever see again. And um, yeah, so she would a lot of times buy that. That's why it's kind of weird to think about, because a lot of mm -hmm. stuff my grandmother would just, yo, you ever seen this? And, be, and this one, she was, you know, learning how to... I don't know how old she was when she died, but she had like a, um, you know, her iPhone. She'd yeah. take a picture of like, oh, yay or nay. So I think the last drums I bought that I know I bought was like Noble and Coolies. Oh, cool. And like, so I got like a few Noble and Coolies that I bought because I really love those drums. And um, I bought uh, I bought a couple Metal Rogers drums, just like stuff like that. And like, so like not really, I like the ones with the clips on the hoops, yeah. but I haven't really got into them because a lot of times when I see them, they're too expensive. Like, I've been mean, wanting like a Black Beauty, but it's like five Gs. Yeah. I'm like, I can get this Black Beauty or I can get this 1972 Camaro. And yeah, I'm like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to choose sometimes, yeah. especially when you got so many drums, man. You start feeling like a hoarder. Your girlfriend's calling you a hoarder because you got like <laughs> seven drum sets in there. Yeah, I've it. seen so, yeah. a picture of your drum room, man. I. It's it's a great thing though I imagine. Yeah, and a lot of them, a lot of them, the drums that I have are they're they're tuned mad differently. Like I have one kit that's like I take out to gigs, you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's like a multi-purpose. This drum set can get bashed around, and I'm not that mad, you yeah. know what I mean? Then I'll have like the the Africa kit, and it has black hardware, and my green one has black hardware and stands, and I'm just scared it's gonna get chipped. Yeah. So I just leave it up, you know, or I, I only allow it to be on tour with techs where I know they're gonna take care of it and baby it. And then um, I have a Rasta kit that I haven't got to bring out, which has got like 26 inch bass drum. Yeah, I see that. But you know, it's, it's a giant Rasta kit, you know what I mean? And, I, and I, those colors is like, it's kind of like straight to my heart, the Rasta kit and the Africa kit. So I kind of baby those more than anything. And then I have the acrylic kit, which is fragile, because that was the Mars Fulton yeah, kit, and it got cracked kit. a lot. And then. Um, I had a natural color kit. The one I love that one the most because of the sound. The sound of those kits that don't have anything on them. Yeah. They're just like no wrap, no, barely any lacquer. I love those because they just breathe more than the other ones. Um, so I've been just dabbing, dabbling. So I have one that's tuned like Jeff Picaro. It's like blah blah, like Steve Gadd almost, yeah. real low. And then I have one that's tuned real jazzy um, that I play and. When I play, and I, I have them set up in the same room, so it's really weird, you know what I mean? Because you, you can really tell the difference. And um, a lot of them have different size. Um, just, I just, just I just, I just, I look at them. Yeah, I look at them differently. So it's not like I'm just hoarding them. So when I, you know, a everyone girl, has a purpose. Yeah, a girl, I mean, a girl would be like, a girl, my girlfriend would be like, you're hoarding, but for me, it's like, you know, I can't really get rid of the little practice kit or the acrylic kit, because it's like, yeah. or, you know, it's the Rasta kid. What do you yeah. do with that? Like, yeah. what do you do with the African kid? I'm, I'm black. I'm African. Like, yeah. what do you want from me? You know. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about your uh, thump drums. I was real interested in that company. Like, 
How does that the, Man, that sound compare? You know, fiberglass compared to uh, acrylic. You know, is well, because I think it'd be some, somewhat the same. You know, because it's similar material, not necessarily the same, but yeah. Well, this guy's name is Andrew Jones. Um, he's from um, he's from Ventura. Uh -huh. He was making drums for um, for Zach Hill, who played with Hell at the time. Now he's playing with Death Grips, and um, he's a he's killing. A lot of people sleep on Zach Hill, but he's killing. And um, he had these kits, man, that with the bass drum was a 16, and it was like a 30 by 16. Yeah. And I was like, who's making them? He's like, this kid from Ventura. He's just, like, he's a, a skater, and he's just making drums. And so I hit him up. And then I was like, man, dude, let's, let's do one real kit. Like, one real kit. Not a 30-inch bass drum, but like a real kit with hardware, front to back heads, because he's making baby kits, he's making kits with only one head on them, yeah. some of them. He was just really just experimenting. I was like, let's make one that I'll play on the whole Memorials thing. You know, it was 12, 13, 16, 8, 16, 15, 18, and it had like a snare in the floor tom. So I could play like a low snare, I could have the, um, oh, gotcha. I could hit the strainer on the floor tom. Gotcha. Um, so, which is some new stuff that I don't see too many drummers doing, but I have, I have a few kits like that where you can hit the strainer on the floor tom and have another snare. Yeah. But, um, so we tried that and then the bass drum and it just sounded yeah. huge. It was like, we got the hardware from DW, they were discontinuing the PDP Platinum Series. Yeah. And, um, they, they let us buy hardware. At first I asked them what they help us and what they drill the holes and those guys are wood guys and they don't make those acrylic shells. Yeah. We see Tommy Lee or me or anybody who has those acrylic shells, they're, they're made at RCI, yeah. makes those and sends them to all the, most of the companies, even Crush, like they send them and they put their stuff on them. And so RCI is pretty legit with that and they do all different colors. And so, um, you know, I was like, you seen the RCI stuff? And they like, it will drill that because it's softer and they've experimented with it. Yeah. They haven't experimented with this kind of like stuff. He does it with resin. It's the like a resin, glass, yeah. yeah. And um, you know, it's kind of like how surfboards are kind of made. It's not the same, it's not him melting surfboards down, but it's the same stuff, so it flexes. So we were doing experiments where we were throwing them off like stairs, like we were throwing <laughs> down 30 stairs and hit them. And like I was throwing them in the air with the hardware and it hit the ground and I play a gig with it. So it was like indestructible. So for what I was doing with my band having like a band in a van where like I was taking soft cases out, like it was perfect. Yeah. Cause I didn't have to think about breaking none of these DWs that I'm scared to tell, like, it, you know, the van could get stolen. I just lost an $8,000 kit with symbols, all the stuff, I'd have been sick. Yeah. So it was like, this kit is like not crazily expensive and it's, you know, it's indestructible, let's do it. So we did one. Then, but it was rushed. You know, he didn't really get to sand the, the, the drums how he wanted. And then the second one, we did another one, and then it was it was awesome. And then we started selling drums. And so we got uh, a lot of people who started getting real interested in it. And at this point right now, we're at a, a standstill because we're trying to, um, right now we're trying to get our hardware game together. Because it's kind of hard to, like, most drum companies buy hardware and buy shells and put a logo on them. Yeah. But like when you're like making your own shells, you kind of do yourself a disservice to start buying some hardware. We might as well get our own lugs. Yeah, because we're we're doing something something that nobody else is doing. Yeah. So, you know, we're at a standstill trying to get all that together. But um, it's still going. Um, Andrew's still doing his stuff. He has a warehouse and there's other people helping in the in the factory. It's just for me I'm a DW artist. Yeah. So, you know, every time, you know, me him me and his 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 venture is still like square, but I can't like, you know, like not appreciate all the stuff DW's ever done, even giving us the hardware for those drums. Yeah. And like so a lot of times when I'm doing something that's ginormous like suicidal, I feel like I feel like it's it does them a disservice to not play their stuff because those are the people who are actually really like looking out for me, even in my experimental mindset. Cause they know I'm the, I tell them stuff that they'd be like, what the hell? Like, because my mind is so weird, dude. I remember seeing all those drum magazines and I was just fantasizing, like looking at collar rock rack um, ads where the dude had a like lime green, like drum cage with snakes on it. I'm like, losing it. And like, you just, I forget it. You forget about that. Cause you got so many guitar centers making drum companies make like $1,200 drum sets that people just stop experimenting. Yeah. You know what I mean? People stop trying to come up with stuff and they just get lazy. They're like, Oh, let's put holes in it. And like put holes in it. Yeah. Let's just put holes in it and sell it and yeah. call it the a hole symbol. It's like, yeah. all right, bro. And that's the, that's, that's the industry right now. 
you know, and it's been like that for ten years. Let's put hole in the let's put two holes in the kick head. Yeah. Let's put I, I, let's put holes in the toms. Like it's like all right. Let's put holes in the sticks. It's like every just everybody put holes in everything. So next like, it'll be square holes, right? <laughs> and so it's always something. But I really appreciate all my companies, DW Zildjian, like the people there. They're like family. Yeah. That's why I haven't really moved around to people. Like a lot of a lot of the movements I made. Like I made a, a, a move from Vader to the Pro Mark, and it had to do with just like I just love the stick. Yeah. You know, when I was younger, I used to play the S. I think it was the seven thirty nine or something. It's like the little beaded tip, but it was like an eight an eight A. Yeah. But it was like a little beefier. And from Regal Tip, and I used to play Regal Tip. Sticks always were weird for me because I've been playing since I was a little kid. Yeah. So it's like as you grow older, you're like, oh, this is like a real, this is like extension of your body. So yeah. that's the, the, the majority of like my movements in the in industry endorsement field. But um, well, it makes always, sense. I mean, you're gonna play something that you want to play, not because they're giving you a deal. That's yeah. That's some people are be, like you know? that. Some people are getting a nice fat check. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, but it's for me. It's always been about like this, if I like the stuff, you know, or if I, you know, it's real com comfortable. Like I feel real confident in Evans. I feel real confident in like Promark, yeah. and I don't get scared. Like I don't pick up a stick and it weighs something different when I'm playing like the fastest song of my life. And yeah. It's like I pick up the heaviest stick. Or like, you know, when I was with Rima, I would get a coated head and it would be smooth. Or like a, a clear head and it would be gray. Like, why is this head gray? Yeah. Like it's like they ship everything they make. You know what I mean? So a lot of that a lot of that stuff is just cause I'm really looking at the drums. Like I have a I look at the drums and be like, you know, because I've been playing all my life. I can see like, you know, I remember when Orange County first made drums, they had a riser, they had a riser problem where they didn't put risers on the bass drum. So they would have the lug, and then the claw would be pointed upwards and clawing on it. And that's because they weren't making drums forever. You know what I mean? Like, DW is messed up many times. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, Zildjian messed up plenty of times, you know, where some people haven't had that, that kind of stuff. And I, I noticed that, that, that stuff with newer drum companies a lot now, you know. But that's been a lot of my, my stuff. Is there any... any uh Anything when you go out on the road, like whether it be like a gel or any any type of product that you just, it makes your job easier, you know, like? Not really. I mean, I think the heads make my job easier. Like if I have my actual drum heads, because sometimes I'll go to different countries and they'll have my drums, they'll have the same sizes, yeah. but I'll be playing like weird drum heads. I'm like, what is this, you know? Or Remos, and I really don't like Remos. Or I'll be, you know, playing different heads. Usually is the thing. Yeah. Other than that, I'll be, um, I'll be hanging. You know, everything else is usually chill. It's just the heads mostly because I can tune um, the the DWs. I can tune those with with Evan so easily for yeah. me. You know what I mean? They're just the easiest ones to tune. I, I haven't really, really got a new set of Remos to even, you know, say anything. I, I used to play Remo when I was like 17, 16. I'm 30 years old now, so it's a long time ago. So I might have a biased opinion, but. For, I can totally tune those Remos and those in my sticks, you know, and just like other than that, I don't put muffling on the drums. Yeah. You know, I don't put muffling in the bass drum. Yeah. You know, I use people like Run wide get, open. they trip out on that. They're like, bro, you don't have no pillow on here. I'm like, no. Nah, I, I think, think this I think we're all pretty much the same. I know Sean and uh, Jerry that owns the shop. We run all open wide. Yeah. And like you say, people it's are true. like, how come here? What do you got on your bass drum? Like, it's like nothing. You know. It's, yeah. it's, no pillow, no, no, wide open, you know. Yeah. But uh, I know we're running a little short on time. I gotta get you back over there. But uh, is there any other uh, projects you're working on after this? Uh, yeah, tour man. Stuff? Um, after this tour, I'm doing another Memorials record in July, which is uh, going to be kind of crazy because I don't know what I'm going to do. And then <laughs> um, I have a record coming out with Trash Talk in a couple days. Um, it's called No Peace, and I hope you buy it. And then in June or July, I have another record coming out with Doug Pinnock, Eric Gales, and um, yeah, it's a trio. And then um, at some point of this year, hopefully Lauren Hill's record will come out. And then what else did I do? I did something else. I don't remember. I played on a few records this year. And then um, I'm just like really concentrating on playing in Suicidal. We're doing another tour with Slayer. And um, we're doing some, I think we're doing Japan, which I'm excited about, and we're doing Korea, which I'm excited about because I've never been to Korea and I love Japan. And then I think we're doing, that's pretty much it. Like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of pacing it. And I got, you know, I might be doing some stuff with some other people that I don't know if I even should speak on, but um, I'm supposed to be doing some jazz stuff. I'll just say that. Cool. And I'm real hyped about that because it's like, it's not just straight ahead, but it's more like a jazz fusion thing. And um, I even got, you know, 
um, we even been talking, me and Christian Scott, about doing some stuff. So, but we are, our schedules are so different that yeah. it's so hard to do. But I'm totally about to be playing more jazz, which I'm excited about also. Awesome. Well, I'd like to thank you and uh, let the guys know on the page. Uh, our Pro Mark sticks kind of FedEx kind of lost them, but uh, <laughs> Thomas went ahead and signed a drum head for us, so we'll be doing a giveaway with that. And when the sticks do get here, we'll just randomly select them out. Sorry, they awesome. won't be signed, but. Yeah, man, it's been kind of weird. I even had a hard time getting drumsticks. Something happened with, like, some in the factory going down, and they're like, we got to get them to you, so just be patient. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, we'll get some out to you, but i like to thank you again for thank you. taking the time out, and uh, keep on staying tuned to the page guy. Check out all the projects. It sounds like for a man who's taking it, taking it easy and keeping on pace, he's got a lot going on, yeah. so uh, appreciate it. Till next time, guys. Thank you. See you. Peace. Thank you. Cool.